been a joy to be here these today and fellowship with you around the word. Appreciate the good lunch that was provided for us. And uh, appreciate Preacher allowing us to be here again. I don't know how long I've been coming here. I've been coming here probably long enough for you to take me off your taxes. <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to come. Do not take it lightly. Uh, this door that has been afforded to us. Uh, if you'll allow me tonight, I'll not have you to stand. I won't read no text. I'll just read a little bit and preach a little bit uh, like we did this morning. That seemed like that worked out pretty good. And uh, we're in the book of Colossians again. You'll remember the old writer of yesterday called this the Jesus book. And... Uh, he called it that because Paul mentioned Jesus 74 times in this book. There's only 95 verses in this book. Uh, he mentioned him almost every verse. For me, I call it the New Testament hymn book. You talking about a H-Y-M-N? Oh, no. I'm talking about a H-I-M book. Of course, I get to thinking about H-I-M every now and then. I want to break out in an H-Y-M in and uh, sing unto him. We found the nucleus or the hub that would hold this book together, the theme, if you would. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 9, Paul said, In him, that's one of the 74 times he's mentioned, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead body. All of God dwelling in Christ. All his attributes, all his powers, all his characteristics. It would be impossible for you to tell the difference in God and Christ tonight. They're one and the same person. So powerful. You say, what's the big deal about that? He tells us in chapter 1 and verse 27 that this person Christ come and dwells now inside of me. Amen. So now I've got all of God dwelling inside, not part of God, all of God, dwelling inside of me. Amen. I mentioned the life lesson that this book has been teaching me. I don't know, some of you may be further along than I am. You probably got this all nailed down. I don't even know I started kindergarten yet trying to learn this life lesson. Here it is. Absolutely nothing in this life is about me. I don't know what you're going through tonight. I'm often tempted to think it's about me. But nothing's ever been about me. Amen. It's all about him. Nothing's about you. It's all, he, everything that happens to you, it's about him. That's not an easy lesson to learn. And in this book, Paul would share with us four or five relationships we must establish with Christ. If we're going to be able to project to the world without us saying anything, without us, you know, you know, Baptists, they got all kind of titles on them, pre-trib, pre-meal, and King James. They put all those titles on because they ain't got enough power to blow the fuzz off a peach. <laughs> got to let people know who you are. I tell you, you got the Holy Ghost on you. You don't have to let nobody know. They will see nothing's about you. It is all about him. I'm interested in, I'm interested in projecting that. Paul told us in chapter 1 that we must know him as the personal Christ. This morning we noticed that we must know him as the powerful Christ. I wish I had time. Chapter number two, he would share with us that we must know him as the persuasive Christ. If you have decided today, the rest of my life, I want to pursue projecting to the world that nothing's about me, it's all about him. He shall become the persuasive Christ to you. He will keep pressing you to go deeper. He will keep pointing out your shallowness. He will press you to go higher. You're not high enough with me. 
He will press you to get closer. He will constantly tell you, you're not close enough. Get closer. You want to project to the world. It's not about me. It's all about him. Wish I had time to look in chapter 4, knowing him as the practical Christ. But I believe the Lord has assigned me tonight to look in chapter 3. If I am going to pursue to project to the world that nothing's about me, it's all about him. I must know him as the perceptive Christ tonight. I assure you tonight, and by a life of experience, in my own life experience, if you set out tonight to live your life, to project to the world, that it's not about you, it's all about him, God will let you see things that he will not let other people see. I don't know about you, I'll not speak for you, but I am extremely interested in seeing more of God than you can. Are you listening to me tonight? Yes, I am extremely interested in seeing the unseeable. I am extremely interested tonight in believing the unbelievable tonight. Old Ravenhill said, the true man of God that pants after God, he said, he shall let you see the unseeable. He will let you believe the unbelievable. See, there's a lot of folks that say, oh, bless God, I don't believe that. I don't understand it. I don't see it. Doesn't mean it's not true. You ever figured out how they get all that people in that TV? I got a TV over at the motel. That thing ain't got a wire no bigger than that on the back of it. That thing's got thousands of people in that box. Where did they get up to that wire? Oh, bless God, I ain't messing no remote. I don't understand it. Man, I can flick that thing with the best of them. Are you listening to me tonight? person who is extremely interested, projecting to the world, it's not about me. It's all about him. He'll let you see some things. I notice as we begin to read down through this and unpack it, chapter 3 and verse number 1 and 2, I notice that he will give you resurrecting perception. Resurrecting perception. He will allow you to see tonight the unbelievable. What is it? That I am right now living on the resurrected side of the tomb. Amen. What? I am right now living on the resurrected side of the tomb. Look at verse number one. If, Paul says. That little word if is a very interesting word. It is a conclusion drawn from a confident fact. Paul said, if ye then be, what? You're risen. That means you've had to die at some time or another in order to get up. You wouldn't have to go down to Titusville and get a rocket science degree to figure that out. Why? When Christ died, I died with him. When they buried him, they buried me. They ain't going to bury me no more. When he arose, I arose. I ain't arising no more. When he ascended, I ascended. When he sat down, I sat down. Amen. I am tonight living on the resurrection side of the tomb. You say, what's the big deal about that? Man's greatest fear is dying. You know, bless God, I ain't afraid to die. How come you keep going to the doctor? If you ain't afraid to die, throw caution in the wind, I wouldn't go see another one of them. 
You don't want to get on today's load, do you? <laughs> Did he not tell Martha down there at the graveyard, he that believeth in me shall never die. Wow. You looking at an old boy, ain't no way you can ever put him in the ground. Wow. Paul's explanation of death, he explained it with two words. Absent, present. Absent, huh, present. I stand it that long. Huh. <laughs> Listen to me tonight. Oh, for the child. I was wondering tonight. Please help me with this. Has God ever convinced you tonight it's impossible for you to die? Please tell me. Please tell me. The day he convinced you of that, you didn't do this. I like I had a spell. And I realized it's impossible for me to die. How many of you here tonight? This is yes. This is no. This is I don't know. How many of you here tonight love Hershey's candy kisses? Man, them things is good. My wife said, that's why God gave you two jaws. Candy kiss in both of them. I love that, don't you? You ever looked at a candy kiss? It's got a wrapper on it. Silver cord coming out of it. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes that when you die, God shall pull the silver cord. Right. You remember him saying that? You say, preacher, that's the only thing I know was that body. Tempted to go out there to the graveyard, talk to that body. I'm telling you, when your loved one died, God pulled the silver cord and took the candy kiss to his house and left you the wrapper. I do not in Winneville, Georgia, have a stack of wrappers beside my brown chair. Say, honey, I just got a I got a love for them rappers. So oh, don't mess with them rappers. I just oh I just love. No. I have to discard the rappers. But I got good news. He's coming one day with the kisses. <laughs> He gonna put them back in the wrapper. Wow, what a day that will be. But today, I am living on the resurrection side of the tomb. It's possible for me to die. You realize how much you would throw caution to the wind tonight if you really believe that it was impossible for you to die. Some of you would quit trying to take such good care of yourself. Huh? You listening to me tonight? I notice in this text, it's resurrection perception. Not only would he tell us we're living on the resurrection side of the tomb, I notice in verse number one, he would tell us that we're living on the reigning side of the throne. He says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You say, what's the big deal about Christ sitting on his throne? Paul told me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, that he has made me to sit, present tense, right now, in heavenly places. I am not on my way to heaven. You can be on your way if you want to. I am already there. That's how come I'm not all here. Because I ain't all there. One day I'll have to tell me to get up so I can sit down. You listen to me tonight. I'm not looking at this thing from this perspective. I'm looking at this thing from this perspective. You look at things from this angle. I tell you, all you'll do is worry. You look at this thing from this direction. You won't do anything but worship. Amen. Oh, I'm reminded 
reminded of old Pilgrim's progress. So many Baptists remind me of the picture down at Interpreter's House. Remember he took Christian down to Interpreter's House. Interpreter's picture of the Holy Ghost. And there was a picture down there of an old boy with a muck rake. He's raking muck. Oh, he's busy raking muck. Above him in the picture was a golden angel with a crown inviting him to sit down upon a throne. And instead of obeying the picture, he just kept with his muck. Oh, why do you put me in the mind of that? You're just muckrakers. You never realize that you're already at home living on the reigning side of the throne. Amen. Are you listening to me tonight? My citizenship's in heaven. My citizenship's not down here. Citizenship is over there. I love the hound out of that, don't you? We ought to stop right there and shout, and some of you ain't never shouted. Huh? Resurrecting perception. I notice also in this text, if, if, Decide tonight, I want to project to the world. It's not about me, all about him. Know him as the perceptive Christ. I give you resurrecting perception. I notice in verse number two, he give you reliable perception. Reliable perception. Notice the center of our reliability. Verse number two, set your affections on the independent Baptist church. Doesn't even say that in the Living Bible, does it? Oh, gracious. Man, I better read that again. I tell you, you might set your affections on a Baptist church if you want to. You'll probably be worse off than what you were when you started. He said, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Your affections, it would be your thoughts, your feelings, uh, your treasures of your heart, uh, one's appetite. He said, set them on things above where Christ dwell. Put all of them upon him tonight. I'm telling you, that's not an easy matter. I'm telling you, your thoughts will drag you this way. Stop it. Turn your thoughts that way. All your feelings will be pulled this way. He said, stop that. He said, give me your feelings. Your doings will be pulled earthly. Don't do it. He said, give me your feelings. Center of our reliability. But I notice in verse number three, there's the comfort of our reliability. I hate to even show you this. I know you ain't gonna believe it. He says, for ye are dead. Well, ye are dead. Dead. How many of you have ever seen a dead person? I'm waiting for the rest of you. Ever seen a dead person? <laughs> have you ever seen one worried or in a hurry? <laughs> wow. You ever walked by one and said, man, they look so peaceful. They look like they're asleep. Paul said, we are dead. How are we dead? He said, we are dead with Christ. Wow. I'm talking about this thing of reliability, the sinner, but the comfort of it. I'm interested in that little word with. The Old Testament, it's a little word with. You remember Joseph, the Bible said he had God with him. Old Testament, God took up a five-fold relationship with man. He would go before him. He would come behind him. He would get beside him. He would get over him. He would get under him. No more. Does he do that? No, 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 no. Now, he's dwelling inside of you. He now takes up a sevenfold relationship with you. 
He does go before you. I'm telling you, he's going to get there before you do in every situation. You talking about, I hope somebody's got my back. Yeah, he does. He said, I'm behind you. He says, I'm beside you. You and I can fellowship together. He says, I'm over you. There'll be no hellish attacks from the God of the air. He says, I'm under you. The imps of hell won't be able to get you from below. He says, but I'm taking up two more relationships with you. He said, I'm going to get inside of you. And he said, I'm going to let you get inside of me. I'm telling you, that is the place. Place where you will be saved. Sin, sale, or Satan cannot get to you there. Amen. Can't molest you there. I love that, don't Amen. you? I'm talking about seeing the unseeable, believing the unbelievable, the reliability perception. But I notice also in verse 4, Talking about project, I want to project to the world. It's not about me. It's all about him. You have to know him as the perceptive Christ. Well, how would I know if I'm knowing him? Oh, there'll be some resurrecting perception. There'll be some reliable perception. But I notice in verse number four, there'll be some returning perception. He says in verse number four, when Christ who is our life, shall appear. Then. I was interested in that word, then. It is our little word for now. Paul believed that Jesus could come at any moment. I hope what I'm going to tell you right now won't suck air out of this room. But Paul was not a premillennialist. What? Paul was not a pre-tripper. Paul was not a post-millennialist. Paul was not an amillennialist. Paul was not a mid-tripper. How, how do you know that, preacher? You hadn't invented them yet. <laughs> but I'll tell you what Paul was. And I'm finding more and more as I travel across America, the people, oh, lots of them, that have got it all charted out. None of them seem to be what Paul was. You've got just a second, just a sec. Hold your finger there in Colossians. Flip over to the book of Hebrews, chapter number nine. This was Paul's position on eschatology. This is the only position that he ever espoused. He says in verse 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Paul was not a pre-tribber. He was not a pre-meal. He was not post-meal. He was a looker. I don't care what your eschatological view is tonight. If it ain't causing you to look for him, I can't. Amen. Amen. Are you listening to me tonight? I'm talking about he could come before the service is over. Amen. I want to project that to the world. When is the last time you were down there at Walmart and that old girl was checking out, uh, 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 checking out your groceries? When is the last time you told her, you know, that the Lord could come back while me and you standing here? She get uneasy. You're listening to me, I'm telling you tonight, I want to project to the world. It's not about me. It's all about Him. This returning perception. There is the wind of His return. He could return any time now. Amen. Paul was looking for him. Amen. Paul had his eyes on the sky. Paul wasn't charting. They didn't have arrows going up, arrows coming down, freely gold dust over here. Got Satan bound, Satan loose. No, he just believed he's coming. Amen. Looking for him. I want to be a looker. Don't you? Looker. I notice also there is the what of his return. He says, when Christ, who is our life, in verse 4, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I was interested in that little phrase, who is our life? 
was interested in that word life. The little word life there is our little word for perpetual breath. Perpetual breath. He is our life. You know, as I travel across America, I'm noticing more and more Baptists want to change this life. We want to put things back in the closet. We want to change this life. I'm telling you tonight, the only thing that can change this life is living his life. It is the only thing this life will bow to is that they see in you that it's not about you. It's all about him. I was reminded of old J. Vernon McGee when he pastored out in L.A. Mayor of L.A. called him and she said, would you join us on a council to clean up L.A.? He said, no, ma'am, I won't. She said, you're not interested in cleaning up our city and making it better. He said, no, ma'am, I'm not. She said, well, what are you interested in? He said, God didn't call me to clean up this pond. He just called me to fish in it. thinking we're trying to clean the pond up. We ain't doing much fishing, though. Are you listening to me tonight? Oh, talking about the returning perception. I'm hurrying to an end. I notice also there is a revealing perception. Revealing perception. If you decide tonight, I want to live my life projecting. It's not about me. It's all about you. Know him as the perceptive Christ. He'll show you some resurrecting perception, some reaching and returning perception. I notice in chapter 3 and verse 5, there'll be revealing perception. Here's another one of those verses I wished I could cut out of my Bible, throw it away. I call it the revealing law. He says, mortify. Therefore, your members put to death yourself. Matter of fact, he says in verse number nine, he says, put off. That little word put off has the idea of radically eradicating, racing out the old man with all its deeds. I remember years ago when I was pastoring on the University of Georgia campus, Springtime, girls lay around with hardly no clothes on. And I asked the Lord one day, how in this world would I be able to die to those filthy thoughts? Immediately, sitting in my study, God led me to Romans chapter 6. You got a minute just to go over there real quick? Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. I said, Lord, how can I say no to the filthy thoughts that bombard me? I know some of you are looking at me like you ain't never had no filthy thought. Some of the most filthiest thoughts I've ever had is in a Baptist church. You're listening to me tonight. Romans chapter 6, verse number 6. Knowing this, Knowing this. It's interesting in that little word knowing. It is akin to the word that is first used in Genesis when the Bible says, and Adam knew Eve. They brought forth a child. He says you must become extremely intimate with this truth. Knowing this, that our old man is. I didn't know if you'd see that word or not. Being in the 10th grade three times, you would realize that I might have a problem with that word, is. But I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, it is my understanding that that's present tense. 
is. What I've got problems with is the next word. Crucified. No! That's past tense. They taught me in English that you ought not to put present and past together. Paul must have not took the course. He says, knowing this, that our old man is present tense, crucified, duh, past tense. When they nailed Jesus to the cross, God the Father looked down on Calvary's tree. He did not see his son hanging there. Oh, no. He saw me hanging there. And he unleashed all of hell on that cross because he saw me hanging there. But now that it's over with, when he looks at me, he don't see me no more. But he sees his boy Jesus now. And all the things he believes to be true about his boy Jesus, he believes to be true about Amen. Him. Amen. Oh, but it's bigger than that. Oh, it's bigger than that. Knowing this, that my old man is present tense. When they nailed Jesus to the cross, they nail my old man up there with him. Wow, gracious, that's good news. Because I'm going to tell you something, my old man been giving me fits. But watch this, that's present tense, is right now. When they took Jesus off the cross, they left my old man up there. It's still nailed there. Are you listening to me? You could have yourself a spell. If you believe that. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, that's the air of temptation, that's all that that maliciously tries to get you to do wrong, he says is destroyed. The old church of God, they said that word destroyed means annihilate. Old man's been annihilated. Better go check that word destroyed in the Greek. It means to render powerless. Oh. When I believe tonight that my old man is still hanging on Calvary, I can walk victorious over sin, self, and Satan. Amen. Back to my little problem at the University of Georgia with the Necky girls. The Lord told me, verse number six, he says the next time you're tempted to think dirty, he says, why don't you just believe that you're dead? I got to think it. In my mind, I'm going to go to our funeral home there in town, Lord and Stephen's funeral home. They've got a coffin in the back that's $40,000. It's got a fella down pillow in it that is probably from here to the floor. Man, that thing looks comfortable. When I see that naked girl, I'm going to get up in my coffin. I'm going to believe that I'm dead. As she walks by, I hear tell dead people don't think dirty. While she's walking by, I'm going to reckon myself dead. After she gets by, I'm going to get out of that coffin and I'm going to walk in newness of life. I'm telling you, that little illustration will work on bitterness too. That little illustration will work on jealousy too. That little uh, illustration will work on arrogancy and pride too. I love that, don't you? Some of you would do good to get in the coffin tonight and believe yourself to be dead to sin. I love that, don't you? There is a revealing law. But I notice last of all, Back in Colossians, I'm closing. Colossians chapter 3, there is a revealing lesson. You say, preacher, how can I tap in to that old man being dead? Paul said in Colossians 3, verse 15, let the peace of God, 
rule in your heart. What's that all about? I hear people all the time talking about peace like it's a thing. They'll say, boy, I feel so peaceful. What's it feel like? I've had feelings before. I've eaten pizza late at night, thought I was going to die before morning. <laughs> but I'm still here. Just a feeling. See, this peace with God messes us all up when he put that word rule there. It is our little word for umpire. What? Umpire. We find immediately the peace of God is not a thing, it is a person. Jesus said, when I moved inside of you and all the fullness of the Godhead bodily moved inside of you, he said the Holy Ghost moved inside of you. And he said he is the umpire of your soul. You got an umpire in sports. He blows the whistle on you when you go out of bounds. Not this one. He'll blow the whistle on you before you go out of bounds. And if you go out of bounds, it's because you have ignored the whistle. I love that, don't you? Do not tell your mate, hey, I just accidentally did that. No, it's been digging its way out of you for a long time because you thought it was about you, not about him. You have ignored a lot of whistles. I love that, don't you? Let the peace of God rule in you. I notice also in this text, in Colossians 3, verse 15, and 16, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The only way you can project to the world that nothing is about you, it's all about him. You must be full of this book. I notice a lot of you don't even have a Bible with you. Or you're into share a Bible. Are you listening to me? You must be full of this book. You remember... The analogy in the Bible with the Word of God, milk and meat, milk and meat. You ever given any thought to the difference in milk and meat? It's awful deep. I don't even know if you can get this or not. I may, I may have taken us way in over our head now. The difference between milk and meat. One of them comes from a cow, and the other one is the cow. Extremely deep, ain't it? <laughs> most, most Baptists in this hour are on a milk diet. I don't care how deep he gets. Once he takes it in, shakes it up, homogenizes it, gives it to you, it ain't nothing but milk. If you want some steak, you got to open the cow yourself and cut yourself some off. I love that, don't you? Of course, you know why we don't want to get in this book, don't you? James said it's a mirror. Rut row. <laughs> I've never looked in this book and it told me I was looking good. <laughs> never. I was in Ashburn, North Carolina not long ago. I know what size I wear. I was walking the mall. A fella passed me walking the mall. And I am confident that he was a 5X. And he was wearing a small t shirt. <laughs> he had on orange psychedelic tennis shorts. And he was walking. Everything from here to here was out. My wife laughed at me because I told her there ain't no way he's got no mirrors at his house. <laughs> ain't no way he looked in the mirror before he looked. He, Man, I look good. Woo, I look good. Ain't no way no mirror told him that. That's how come you don't want to get in this book. Because this book is not going to tell you you're looking good. This book's going to point out where you and I have been living thinking it's about it's not about him. Old Fanny Crosby was the great hymn writer. I do a lot of biographical sketches and 
youth camp in the summertime. And I dealt with her life a couple of summers ago. I was really fascinated by Fanny Crosby. One thing I was fascinated about her, she never wrote no blind songs. I don't know about you, if I'd been bo born blind, I, I would have written a couple of blind songs. You know, man, you get George Jones singing a blind song, woo, man, that light up the charts. No, oh, never wrote any blind songs. She did write over a thousand hymns. He said often old Fanny Crosby would be in church. Somebody would be singing. She'd lean over to one of her friends. She said, man, that's a good song. They leaned back to her and said, Fanny, I guess it is. You wrote it. She said, I did. <laughs> she said, I don't even remember writing that one. She wrote so many. But one of them has fascinated me as of late, talking about the perceptive Christ. I've always been thought, uh, uh, taught if you're going to write a song that there should be a theme throughout the song a and the chorus should, uh, uh, should bolster up the theme. This song, every verse, Fanny just stays right on target. She just keeps hammering, hammering, hammering the theme. She gets to the chorus. She goes out and left field. Changes the whole song. Listen to it. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain. Free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. Near the cross a trembling soul love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadows over me. All of the verses, Fanny kept talking about, man, I want to get close to Calvary. I want to get near Calvary. She gets to the chorus. The whole song changes. Listen to what she says on the chorus. In the cross... In the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the rest. Old Fanny Crosby got so near to Calvary, Calvary swallowed her up. Fanny lost her identity. Where is Fanny? It ain't about Fanny. It's all about him. Sin can't get to her. Self can't get to her. Uh, Satan can't get to her. She has gotten swallowed up. Telling you tonight, that is the place God will begin to let you see the unseeable, believe the unbelievable. Would you stand tonight? Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Sister's going to come around, play something on the instrument. I don't know where you're at tonight. You may be a lot further along. And Learning this life lesson that nothing's about you. Everything's about Christ. Maybe all of your kin folk see that in you. See you living it. Your co-workers see you living it. I don't doubt there's a lot of us here tonight that need to get in the coffin. Reckon ourselves dead to some things. I'm telling you tonight, he's coming He'll not give any warning when he comes. I don't know when he comes. I want him to find me. Projecting to the world, nothing is about me. It's all about him. Maybe you're here tonight. You realize, oh, I'm falling so short in this area. You've seen yourself in the mirror of the word of God. Maybe you want to root yourself out of place in this altar. Say, Lord, I don't know how much time I got left, but I sure want to project to the world. Nothing's about me. Maybe you're here tonight and realize for the first time you're lost. God Almighty has never moved inside of you. Somebody as big as God move inside of you, hang out everywhere. The world would see. While we wait a few moments tonight, 
Maybe you want to root yourself out of place in this altar and say, Lord, I want to see the unseeable. Old Moses said he persevered because he had seen him who was invisible. I want to see the unseeable. I want to believe the unbelievable. Maybe you need to come tonight. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Altar's open. You come. You come. You come.